see one online. It's possible. Brought to you by the Service National du Récit de Mendelang. I'm your host, Martin Tremblay, and if you're watching the primary version of this, I will be joined by Nadia Lavando. During this video, we'll show you how to get organized, how to get your students ready to learn online, how to get your students to interact orally in an online ESL class, and finally, we'll give you some more ideas to use technology to support oral interaction. A couple of things you should consider when organizing your online class. First of all, there's the LMS or learning management system. So maybe it's already imposed in your school or school board. So maybe you're, you have to work with Google or Microsoft. Uh, if not, maybe you're already working with uh, an LMS and you want to stick with it so that the students don't need to change all of their habits. The other thing you need to consider are the number of groups and students that can influence the way you're going to organize your files, folders, how you're going to communicate with your students. Uh, it's also great to have a, a schedule, a fixed schedule for video conferences so your students don't need to look for you. Uh, if they know that you're there at specific times all the time, then uh, it will be easier for them to remember or to include you in their schedule. Collaboration with other ESL colleagues is essential uh, because you don't want to be alone in, in this. So maybe your colleagues are already using a platform and you want to use the same platform as them. Or maybe you want to share lessons, uh, collaborate when one colleague makes a lesson and you make the other one. Uh, so you can share the load. You should also decide where and how you're going to share the information to both students and parents and probably stick to what you're going to choose as much as possible. So if you're, you decided that you were going to communicate with uh, teachers, uh, with students using email, then uh, you should stick with that. Um, and you should also keep it simple. One tool can do many things. So you have like teachers who are using a certain tool to uh, communicate to their students, but that, that's also how they're going to uh, share the content of their class. And that's also how they're going to get maybe answers uh, from or assignments from their students. And the other thing as well is to uh, listen for feedback and adjust. So uh, it doesn't mean that because you've adopted something that you should stick with it no matter what. If you get feedback from the students or parents that it's not working, feel free to adjust. The other aspect we're going to take a look at is getting the students ready to learn online. So organizing the students can happen before the lesson. You can give access to information about the class, such as your intentions or your instructions or resources before the class so that the students are truly ready to learn or to do the task that you're going to have them do. Don't forget students with difficulties. So you want, might want to differentiate, uh, maybe use proper fonts for students who would have trouble reading, for example. You can ask students to prepare before the class with videos, readings, reflections, or research so that they're better ready to tackle the subject or topic that you're going to be dealing with. What you can do during the lesson is to take time, of course, to explain the organization, what you're going to do, and how you're going to do it. You can practice turning on and off the microphone and camera, but that should be done way early, or this is for especially primary levels. Remind rules and good citizenship uh, during online meetings. This is uh, very important and we have a couple of tools to offer as well for this. Um, you can also use roles which we're going to see in a second. You can have your students practice toggling between two different windows or tabs. This is especially useful if your students need to do something like video conferencing, but take a look at some documents at the same time. Then you can use self-evaluation or peer evaluation so that you're not stuck doing all of the evaluation by yourself. And it's a great um, practice for your students to develop. What you can do, of course, after the lesson is to follow up with students who had difficulties uh, during your class or those who were absent and take feedback to adjust. 
Now we did say we had some tools. You can uh, find these tools from the Service National du Récit Formation à Distance. Uh, they're the netiquette uh, for the teacher and for the students. So how to be ready to teach and learn online. Uh, so students should not just be made aware of those, but should really understand them. And best practices, of course, for students, so such as setting up their workspace. So it's important that they find a, a quiet space if possible, set themselves some goals, etc. So that too is available for you to download and to share with your students. The other thing that's uh, very important, critical, is plan, plan, and plan it. Okay. Um, so you have a planning tool that you have there, a template uh, that you can uh, that you will be able to to download from uh, Julie Stern and the people at edtosavetheworld.com. Uh, so this was modified uh, to fit uh, our program here in Quebec. You also have a student version there that you will be able to uh, to access. And don't worry, you don't need to copy everything, well, or rewrite everything, I should say. Uh, you can just copy paste the information. Basically, what it means is that uh, everybody should know where they're going and how they're going to get there. So you should start with a learning intention. Use the tools that you're, you and your students already know, or if not, you will have to take the time to teach how these tools work and maybe even let, uh, well, not even, but you have to let the students uh, play with them. And then uh, plan the organization of small group discussions if you're going to do C1. And maybe think about a plan B if things are not working out the way you thought they were going to. Um, so as I was saying, what's, what the planner is going to help you with is to help you see where you're going, but it's also going to show the students where they're going and how they're going to get there. And this is extremely important, not just in a physical classroom, but even more so in, a, in an online class. All right. So best practices to be organized is to develop routines. So if your students come in your class and they know how uh, the English class is going to unfold. Uh, that helps. It lowers anxiety both for them and for yourself. Um, you should make sure expectations are clear to students and that they are visible. So using that planner there is important. Uh, plan short and focused lessons. So you cannot be speaking for 75 minutes. That's not going to happen. All right. So make sure that you plan for short lessons maybe you, you will have some clips there that you could play and then you tell them what to do with it and so on make sure that there is a sequence and that the sequence is clear don't be afraid to use numbers like this is step one step two step three because it's very easy to get lost using different tools or uh, trying to follow part of an online class in an asynchronous way so that means that the student is on his own so where where is he and uh, where where is he supposed to go next so if you have this numbered out then it makes it easier for the students to follow where they were and where they have to go next and you can assign some roles to the students speaking of these roles here they are you'll recognize these roles from the uh, from cooperative uh, learning and so on uh, but they are a little bit uh, modified for online learning so you're you can have a leader and if you have oral interactions, the leader is going to start the meetings. That would be his job. Uh, shares the screen when needed. Because sometimes you will have to watch uh, a video before talking or answering questions. So that would be the leader's job to do that. Uh, the leader is going to keep the team on task. That would also be the leader's job. The reminder, you're going to recognize the timekeeper, so keeps the team aware of time, but also reminds the team of where to go when the team is done and reminds team of success criteria. The note taker, as the name suggests, is going to take uh, notes, summarizing team discussions and decisions within the group and keep uh, all necessary notes. The seeker is going to seek answers to uh, the to questions that the group might have. So just like in a physical uh, environment, you wouldn't have you wouldn't want to have all of your students uh, 
standing up and coming to see you or all of them raising their hands at once. So that would be the seeker's job. So to represent the team when they're asking questions to the teacher and then to report findings to the team. The seeker uh, in high school levels could be a student who would have two devices, maybe check some information on a cell phone while uh, doing a video conference with uh, the team um, on another device like a laptop or a tablet. Okay, so just how can students interact orally in an online ESL class? Remember that before the oral interaction, it's essential to present the intention of the task, the instructions, success criteria, maybe a model of what success looks like and sounds like, that's if they are available. If you don't have any of them right now this year, would be a good time maybe to ask some of the students if you could keep their recording and there are uh, vid video editing tools out there uh, like clips where you could uh, pretty much make sure that the students cannot be identified but you could actually have your other students in future years see and hear uh, what success sounds like without being able to identify the students within the video. You should go over the functional language or better yet, maybe brainstorm the functional language with your students or have them brainstorm it. Uh, you should go over communicative strategies with your students that would be uh, helpful uh, within a C1 and go over the rules, which we have talked about before. You went through how to organize yourself and your students with Martin. I'm Nadia Lorando and I'll be going through Google Meet at the primary level with you. So this is an overview of the best practices with breakout rooms and Meet. You need to organize teams before the class, and you need to provide instructions and a framework so students don't get lost. You also should prepare students for breakout rooms before you send them off, and I'll show you how to do that. One thing you should do also is to assign a facilitator or leader in each room and explain whether groups will have to wait for you to enter each breakout room to get them started. Before you send them out in breakout rooms, make sure they know how long they can be in those breakout rooms. You don't want them to stay there forever and you want them to come back so that you can continue your class as planned. Make sure students have a way to contact you if you're not in the room to help. In the breakout rooms, make sure that they have the information of how to go back to see you. And coach them maybe. Model the, the way to come back. I will show you in Google Meet. But first, let's look at how I organized the groups. So here, there's always at the top a main meeting room. Here. You would put the link to the main meeting room. Now, this is a generic uh, presentation, so I took them off. I, I did not keep the link there. Here, there would be a link to each of the meeting because what happens with Google uh, Meet is that each meeting has a separate link. By putting them all in one document, it means that you have access to all the links and students have access to all the links. So you need to make sure that you clarify how to use this document. You need to make sure they go in the right room, right? But you have access to all of these rooms. So you can, you know, go in the rooms, check if they're actually supposed to be in that room. In this document, you would have the link to each meeting. So there's eight groups, so eight link to meetings and then the names of each team member that have to be in this meeting. There's also a link to the document they need to use in order to have their discussion. In this case, the activity is a Jamboard activity. And it's the same thing for each team. It's a, a good way for would be to check with the students if they're all there. Uh, before you send them in teams, that way they don't get, uh, let's say there's only one student present in a team or they don't, don't stay alone in that team and uh, can't participate in an oral interaction. So let's look at how you actually set up the meetings rooms and how you can do it with them so that they can join the different teams, uh, the different rooms, and you 
can join the different rooms to observe how they are interacting. When you want to use Google Meet to do breakout rooms, you need to create different rooms. Now, in order for you to go visit those rooms, the easiest way would be for you to have them already open before you start the meeting with your students. So in my case, what I did to show you the example is I have two rooms that are not the general meeting room that I'm using with my students. So here I have two students, Nadia, Nadia. Hi, Nadia. Uh, now it's time for Nadia to go in another room. So what she will do is go back to the document. Remember the chart document with all the links? Now uh, you, the student has to go click on that link. But before the student does that, it um, the student has to make sure that they close this meeting here to go in that new room. You don't. You want to be able to stay in that room in case students want need help and they want to go back in the main room. But students, they should leave this room and then go in those gen those other rooms, the meeting breakout rooms, and then they have their discussion. Make sure they tell you tell them how long. And you can always go visit. So let's go see. I'm in the general room here. This is the bigger one. Here, I turn off my microphone, turn off my camera. I don't need it. I can go in another room. Ah, I can go look at this room here. The, I can hear them. And, but they, if I turn my mic off, I can't, uh, they can't hear me. I could also show my face or not. But the thing is, right now, if I keep the microphone, uh, on, uh, because you can also make sure if you look at this little thing, thing here, it, this little uh, add on, it's called mute tab extension. So you mute it right now. It's muted. So I'm not listening to this team talking. I am listening to this one because the mute is not on it's, uh, so this team, I can still hear them, but so if I have eight teams of four. If I have all those tabs open and they're all talking, it's going to be chaotic as if you were in a class. We like that, right? In a class, but maybe not in an online setting. So having that add-on to add a little mute button to mute the whole tab, it means that you don't hear the all the teams at once. You can select the ones that you actually want to hear. And when they're ready, you can actually go back in there, go in their room and say, uh, let's go see, uh, I'll go see, I'll go see that team. And I'll say, oh, you, don't forget, you need to go back in the main room in one minute. Okay. See you. And then you go back and visit the, go and visit each team. If you need to, you listen in, you evaluate, you observe. And, uh, when they're ready, they come back to the main room. So this is how you set it up in uh, Google meet with breakout rooms. The advantage of using small groups is that it helps for evaluation, but it also fosters oral interaction, right? Which is what we want. But to do that, you need to make sure that you give all the necessary tools for them to succeed. A model, strategies, all the resources they need. You can record small group discussions and meet your teams, but you need to check indications that come from your school board first. Also, you can use self-evaluation and peer evaluation to go beyond, to make them think about how they'd, they did. In small groups, what you can do is focus on the students with difficulties. In this section, we'll share ideas of what students can do while interacting online. You can do these activities in the preparation phase, carrying out phase, or the integration phase. If you look on Réseau Pédago Numérique, our website, there are activities created by teachers that you could probably adapt to online activities. We'll be talking about using games, using whiteboards, using surveys, using interactive quizzes, and using video conferencing to interact with the rest of the world. Let's start. In each of these sections, what we'll do is we'll be talking about the type of activity or type of tool you can use and giving you a model of how you could use it. 
So we'll, we have chosen some tools that we like to use because they think they are easy to use. They're usually free and uh, teachers as well as students like them. Let's start. Using games for C1. Now, this is something we like doing at the elementary level, right? We want our students to talk and often when students do games, they don't realize that they're learning. They're practicing vocabulary, they use new language, share opinion, check for, you can check for understanding. They can consolidate newly learned information or activate prior knowledge or build on knowledge related to topics seen in class. So these are ways or ideas of why you would use uh, games to uh, do oral interactions in class, but you can also do them online. So this is a model. What I did is I created a Google slide that, uh, and it could be done on PowerPoint, it could be done on any presentation tool where you could share information. So in this case, I'll show you how it works. And uh, it's in teams of four. So there would be breakout groups or because this is grade three, grade three um, you know, in grade three, we want uh, to be with our students. They need support. So in this case, what I would do is I would suggest, uh, I would offer small meetings for uh, smaller groups of students and as a teacher, I would lead this activity. So what I'll do is I'll show you the example and think that this was done with grade three in mind, but any type of activity where you use a presentation tool for a game could be done for any level. You just need to adapt the level of help, of support that you uh, use, uh, that you use with them. Okay, so now let's look at the grade three uh, presentation that I've created. And it's an activity that helps teachers organize the content of a class. This is what the presentation document looks like. It could be a PowerPoint presentation. It could be, uh, th in this case, it's a Google slide, but it could also be any tool that you use to share information with your students about a class. Now, in this case, what it does is that it gives the student a sequence of all the activities that will be done during the class. It makes it very clear for them to follow. So here, what are we doing today? Well, today it's to class two, last class. We watched a video about animals and colors. You worked with adjectives and animals. You practiced spelling words. Today, you'll use this vocabulary and these expressions you, that you know to play a hangman game with partners. Yay, let's go. So prepare to play the hangman game. Because you want your students to be ready and to feel comfortable, you want to get them started, right? So you'll have them practice the, the vocabulary that they've already seen, but that's okay. They need to practice it maybe a bit more. And you could have asked them also to practice it between the two classes with their parents in order to be better to play the game. By telling them they'll be playing a game, it gives them you know, an incentive to really practice. Today, with the students present, and remember, we're in a small group, four students, grade three, with the teacher. So at first, the teacher will be leading a bit more. So let's say, okay, uh, we'll practice those words. Please, students, spell the word chicken. And then the four students must spell the word and you can hear them well because they're only four. So you can check if they're really saying the letters correctly and they are slowly getting into talking in, uh, with you. So you do a few like that. You play with the words like that, but then it's their turn. They can challenge the other students to spell the words that way. You know, the control goes into their hands and you stay there, but by giving them the power, uh, you know, they become a bit more autonomous and it's like in class, you know, you give them a model and then once they're ready, they can go and do it on their own. So if they need help, there's always that online picture dictionary for help and they have this document. So this means that they can access its information very easily. Also, it's very important to go through the expressions they will need to play the hangman game. 
So you can look at these words. But if you look here, it says, is there a letter of the alphabet like in? The reason is I like to add, you know, just to, for them to talk more. So this is one way in this type of activity. Is there a P like in pirate? Why? Because also it makes it easier for the other person to hear the letter. Within the word pirate, you know that the first letter is a P. But if you just hear P, it could be a B, it could be a D, so it's, it's harder. So by putting a, another a word to confirm the letter, it makes it easier for the other to hear. Now, uh, once they've found the word, uh, it's important for them to say a sentence. So for, if I look here, I added those explanations. So um, at the, the last one, when the word is found, Students have to say something related to that word. For example, the word is mouse. You can say the mouse is in the park or I have a mouse. You know, simple, simple sentences. And the first time you, they do it, you can guide them and give them examples. And maybe, but once they've done it a few times, they may, it may feel a bit more comfortable doing it. In the case of Hangman, there was a vi video that was shared by Lisa. Lisa Vachon, who created this uh, Trousse activity, and it was about how to play hangman. So the link to the video is there for the students to access it. Or maybe, you know, you ask, did you watch it between the two classes? And they say, oh, no. Well, you can watch it again. It's available to you. It's right there. If you don't need to watch it because they all watched it anyways, you don't need to watch it, but it's there in case. Success, success criteria. You need to make sure they know what is expected of them and you're there with them so you can guide them but the younger they understand what they need to do to be good the easier it'll be later on when it becomes a bit more uh, difficult so if you look i'm going to leave this preview and i'm going to show you how this document looks there is student one student two student three student four so each of these four students will have one page so they can set it up for when it's their turn to be the leader. They will have their own board in order to organize everything. So in this case, it's already started. This person is putting lines. Once the letters have been said, they change colors, right? So for example, if, um, well, let's say we'll start with a blank page. We'll change the color of the letters. Ah, it's all white. So uh, the other players say a letter and you say, oh, it's a C. Is there a C like in cat? Ah, there is a C like in cat. So I will copy the C. Uh, and so what? Uh, uh, I will copy the C and put it on the line. If there's a problem and there's no C, I will take the head and put it here and the hangman is starting. So this is one way of doing it. And when the it's time for the player two, then it's the same thing. You do a few games like that. And the more it, they do it, the more autonomous they'll become and the less you have to help them and uh, organize them. After that, of course, you need to, it, it's important for them to think about how they did so using a form, a Microsoft form or, or Google form, depending, they will be able to tell you how it went individually, or you could ask them uh, orally. There's always at the end of the document, need help. In case this activity was done in a channel, they need to know how to join you. So by having it at the end of every document, it'll become a routine for them to say, oh, look at the end, look at the end of the document. This is where we need to find the information uh, if we need help. The last page would be about helping uh, in all the documents or that you share. So this is how it was when you use a presentation document. You can also use whiteboards for C1. Let me show you how to do that. When you use whiteboards, you can have them practice vocabulary, use new functional language, discuss possible answers, and uh, place or things in a timeline or an order, share opinions. Now, one tool that I like uh, using is called Jamboard. 
it is a Google uh, tool, but it there could be any whiteboards available out there that you could use. There is one available in Teams, actually. So the example that I have is one that was done with an activity that Lisa Vachon created also in the Trousse. And that was for grade five, and it was a discussion about nature. And I was wondering, I want students to have all the information needed. So there is a possibility of using a Google slide or a PowerPoint. But in this case, I just wanted to go with something different that could be used in different formats. That way they would get used to it and maybe we could use it for other activities as well. So in this case, I would ask them to join the uh, the uh, Jamboards. And of course, they already know their teams. They uh, remember in the presentation, I had already given them the link to the Jamboard. So all they could do is just join the Jamboard. And that way, they would be able to access it. In this case, there's this is in the uh, Google Meet, that's a little different, but uh, it's the link is there. They can just join it and they have access to the Jamboard. So if you look at this, this is a Jamboard. It's a whiteboard where people can write, uh, but there's a few tools also that you could use. So of course to write, you use the pen here and you can write uh, hello like this. You can have them draw something, play a drawing game. Um, you can erase whatever's there uh, very easily. You can also have them use post-its, for example, dog. Uh, this would become a sticker that appears on the page and they can move it around. So they could arrange things uh, together. As, you know, In this case, what they had to do is the intention was to use the vocabulary and functional language word ton already to be able to talk about the nature around them. They've already discussed a few things and uh, step one would be preparing for the discussion. And then the questions would all be there. The step two is there too. Their roles are there. That way, if they need support uh, to remember what their roles are, they are available to them. And they can add as many post-its as, as they want. And uh, if they need to, they have another page to add vocabulary. So that vocabulary will help them to ha have these discussions here. So this is a visual support for them to go in those meeting rooms and be able to have a discussion together. So this is a whiteboard type of tool. Another type of activity would be to use surveys for C1. You could have them discuss the results of a class survey that was already done to prompt C1. You could have them design surveys for others to do or have them work, prepare them collaboratively for real audiences. For example, they could create a survey and then go survey people around them, their families, friends. You can have them use survey tools to gather data. You could use it as a hook to spark a discussion about the topic that will be seen afterwards in class. It could also be used at the end of an activity to ask groups for feedback. Let's go with the example. Mentimeter is a very, very simple tool. It's so easy to use uh, and it's free. It's online and people can access it from anywhere on any device. So you would have uh, students go in breakout rooms, join a mentee, uh, we call them a mentee, a quiz is a mentee. They join the mentee and then as a team, before they can answer, they have to come to a consensus. So they, you know, let's say they're 32 in the class or 26. Well, if they're in teams of four, three or four, and there's eight teams, there will be only eight answers because before they were allowed to answer, they had to come to a consensus to give one answer. Mentimeter is online, so the, you know, in the case of a, a breakout group for older students, grade six, for example, in a breakout group, the leader would show his uh, or her um, screen, and then on the screen, the others could see 
what the questions are. That way they would have a visual of what the, what the discussion is about. And then once they discussed it and they argued and everything, then they can answer. And as a class, maybe uh, they go back to the general room and then the teacher talks, oh, this was the result. Okay, what made you think that? And then you have a class discussion. But then after that, each student gets information-based text that gives more information. So they each have a different text and now they have more information, but only on part of the answer. So for example, if I look on the next page here, the question was, which beverage do you think is better for the environment? Well, in the first, uh, the first one at the top, you see that they didn't read the text and that's what they thought. Soy milk was better for the environment. Almond milk, uh, one team thought it was that. After reading the text, then they had to argue, but they had different information, right? Four teams decided that basically soy milk was the best one. I'm not sure that's the real answer, but at least what it is, did is that it, parked, it sparked a discussion between the students and they had to come up with a consensus and finally decide, oh, this is the answer um, with the information I have. It's, I think this is the correct answer. And as a team, they decided, okay, this is what we will put in. So this is one way you could use surveys. Using interactive quizzes for C1. Now you could use interactive quizzes to have them agree on a decision again, you know, discussion. Uh, they could create a quiz for others. They could, you could have them discuss inferencing, predicting uh, different opinions, or you could just introduce a new topic by having them talk about something and add prior knowledge. So this is an example that we really like, Edpuzzle. It's something that we created for grade four, and Edpuzzle is a tool that uh, is very easy to use, and the teacher creates an account and cr can upload uh, use a video that's available on YouTube or, uh, you know, in many places, and it will create a video with questions. Now you're wondering, how does that look? I'll show you. Edpuzzle is uh, with YouTube videos, but other videos as well. And what it does is that once you start the video, for example, if we start the video here, we could put it full screen. And at some point, you know, you see the action uh, and a question appears. So in this case, the question is for the students to talk about what the, this is, you know, what is the rabbit, do, rabbit doing? A student could say he's relaxing. The other one is drinking his coffee, drinking carrot juice. You know, they could discuss uh, the possibilities of what he is doing. And then they would all have to, cons to uh, come to a consensus to answer. In this case, we want them to focus on oral interaction. So we would not ask them to write down an answer but they are in smaller meetings or with the teacher. So they are talking and you can observe and, and, uh, and they can practice the talking. So they would skip up. Oh, when is this happening? And it's another question. So these are quick questions. You don't have to do anything there. You, of course the, it was built before. So you created it before or someone else created it because there's so many out there already created, but, it, it's pretty simple. It stops when it needs to stop and uh, it helps students re retain information because it's just there. So uh, this is a very nice tool that you could use with your students. It's an interactive quiz. What I'd like to add about this activity is that this type of activity could be done with any level. All you need to do is adapt the way you do it with your students adapt the type of question, uh, is there more teacher guidance, less, uh, the more, the, the older the students get, the less um, help they need from the teacher, right? So uh, it all depends on what the students of your, uh, the needs of your students are. 
The next one and the final one is using video conferencing to interact with the rest of the world. Now, video conferencing, as we can see, brings us all together, even if we're far. So why not use it to go outside the limits of our own group? One idea would be to have them interact with students, you know, in another city, another country. Uh, there's uh, websites or places where you can get in touch with other teachers and you can set it up and do it in a video conference. You could have them interact and question experts in a certain field. So uh, on a specific topic, you, you know that this person knows his stuff, right? So you go contact that person and have that person join you online. It, this person could be anywhere. You could reach a certain audience for a given project. So to make it, you know, authentic, you could have them talk to someone or uh, to have them present something to an audience that's real, that's there, that wants to know about what they're doing. And you can have them also work collaboratively with people who are outside your school, the one next door or as far as Japan. <laughs> Ideas to interact with the world using Skype. Skype is a tool that is that has been used uh, for a long time to uh, communicate with people around the world. So they have built a big, big project, a big website where you can find tons of ways to communicate with other teachers around the world. So if you look here at watch this video, Skype in the classroom, your students look at that video to give ideas. But here there's primary projects, teachers who shared suggestions, and you have a complete guide to how to get started to use uh, Skype with other classes. So this is it for the ideas. Now, if you want to reach us or if you want information, this page in the document that you're getting is key. So there's a lot of information for you to uh, access. First, there's the Domaine des Langues website where there's tons of activities. Uh, there's workshops, there's webinars, there's if you, if, and there's also a place for the news now. This is a bit modified, but there's a place for news. So actually, this webinar will be posted there, right? So, uh, Réseau Pédago Numérique is a, a network of teachers who collaborate with us to share ideas and they create videos to demonstrate how they do activities in class with their students using technology. There's Campus Ricci. Campus Ricci is a great tool for you to uh, join online courses that are free for you to do. And uh, they're about various subjects. Uh, we have one called Planning the Planification de l'Integration des Technologies. It's in English. Uh, the title is in French, but the content is in English. You can join, it's free, and uh, you can go at your own rhythm. Here at the top, RICI. RICI is a us, you know, the network, and uh, it's the general network that has a lot of information and they offer, you know, they give you information about webinar and there's other RICI also where you can find tons of information. This document here, Web Tools, is a list of tools that we shared related to anything you could do with your students or you could use for yourself as a teacher. So if you click on this link, you'll have access to tons of web tools that you could use in your teaching. Reach out, follow us. Uh, you have the information here, Sandra, Martin and I.